I went. I was in one of those rages, you know, and I forced myself out of the apartments, you know, and I went to get in my truck. And instead of getting in my truck, I, I went around the side of the building. That's where the, her boyfriend was or the guy she was dating. And he was staying there with his sister in the same building. And I went back and, and I knocked on the door. And before somebody answered, I pushed it open. I seen him across the room and I just went right through the living room and across the coffee table and had him by the throat. And his sister happened to be dating a, an LAPD, which happened to be there. They both had me pinned on the floor. This is The Bottom Line. I'm Gary Thieman in Los Angeles. Red flags were everywhere. Life's in session. And Steve W. was absent most of the time. A cavalier attitude with booze and life in general led Steve on a path of destruction. Drunk driving would lead to run-ins with police. And of course, things were not going well at home. However, Steve's life was about to change for the good. Hello, my name's Steve W. I'm an alcoholic, born and raised in West Virginia. Uh, recollection of one of my first drunks was uh, in a bowling alley parking lot. And I was passed out in the back seat you know, when I was learning how to drink, throwing up a lot, always uh, with a lot of pain in the stomach, you know. But I was laying in the back seat of that automobile and I felt this warm stuff running down my face. And I looked up and my good friend Tom was urinating on my head. And I jumped up out of there and I chased him across that parking lot. And if I'd have caught him, I would have killed him. But you know, that was one of my, my first drunks. And uh, I left West Virginia and I got drafted into the army in, uh, and I did an 18 month uh, tour in Korea and I was just totally nuts. Didn't have a lick of sense. Caught the venereal disease uh, 10, 11, 12 times. Drank anything that was in sight, smoked anything that was in sight. And I was just, I was just as wild as they possibly could be. One night I was in a, uh, I can remember being in a uh, foxhole in the main barrier position you know, this is the uh, main bear position. They got all the way across Korea. It separates uh, South Korea and North Korea. And they stationed three or four soldiers in each, uh, each foxhole. And they're about 75 yards apart. And uh, we was all sitting there smoking, you know, smoking this stuff. And, and uh, all at once a flare goes off in front of the foxhole down in front, you know, next to me. And I... Uh, and you're not supposed to be out of your foxhole after it gets dark. And I looked down there and I seen some man, I seen a man standing down there. And I jumped out of the foxhole and I had this uh, automatic uh, uh, weapon. And I hollered, halt, halt, chung ji, chung ji. And this guy took off running. And I thought, oh my God, you know, I'm thinking he might be one of ours, but you know, he's, but he's running. I had to shoot him. And I, and I opened fire and seen tracers land all around him. And he hit the ground and I heard somebody scream, don't shoot. And so I, uh, I said, okay. And, you know, and I started, that made me funny. I started laughing and I couldn't stop. My CEO's trying to call me on the radio and the uh, telephone. And finally he says, what the hell's wrong with you, Wilson? And I said, I don't know, sir, it just struck me funny. And, uh, but you know, I spent 18 months over there. And like I said, I, would, I didn't have a lick of sense. And then I came back to the States, you know, and, you know, it seemed like I was always looking for, for a, uh, a companion, you know, and I was always very lonely, you know, and, you know, and, and, and of course I drank a lot. I remember one night, one time it was right around Christmas, you know, and I had that real lonely feeling, you know, and just, and I was drinking, uh, I had a bottle of black velvet and, uh, I would drink it. I'd been drinking on that all night and it was this fella it needed to ride up to Charleston, a place called Fry's Alley, which is a real rough area of Charleston. I said, well, I'll do, you know. I figured I would do somebody a favor, you know, and that would get me out of myself. And I was trying to be of service, in other words. I gave him a ride to Charleston, and he had to direct me, you know, left, right, you know, and, or what, you know, to, to get to his place. And I dropped him off, and then I got lost in Charleston. It was like two or three o'clock in the morning. And I kept driving around in circles, you know, looking, you know, looking for something that would look familiar. 
and uh, nobody was out on the streets. And I made this one, stopped at this one stop sign and I started to make a right turn. I started turning the steering wheel. And after I got out on the street, I continued turning the steering wheel and, and I hit a telephone post head on. You know, and the steam started roaring from my car, you know, and I backed up and I still started driving, trying to get out of Charleston. All at once this cop pulls over beside me as I'm driving, and I just pull off the side of the road, open up the door, open up his door, and I just got in the car, in the back seat, because I knew I was going to go to jail. And, uh, and he told me, asked me what I hit. I said I hit a telephone pole, and he called, you know, called around to see if there had been any telephone poles knocked down, and they couldn't find it. And so he uh, seemed like a real nice cop, you know, a real nice guy. And he was so nice, I thought, uh, won't you, I seen a telephone booth way up ahead, you know. I said, won't you stop up here and I'll call my dad and he can come and get me. And you know, he pulled over at the telephone booth, you know, and let me out and I went and I called my dad. He was drunker than I was, so he couldn't come and get me. And so I went back out on the street, you know, and there was no, not a car in sight. And all at once I seen these headlights coming and I run around in the middle of the street, you know, and started waving my hands in the air to stop this car. And it was the same cop that just let me off a few minutes earlier. So I got back in the car and I told him, take me out of this town. He told me only a certain area to patrol, so he's going to take me so far, you know. So he took me to the service station and, and these uh, guys in the service station told me that uh, uh, I was lucky that that was the cop that picked me up because he was the nicest cop in town. But anyway, I still tried to get home, and I, and I tried to get on a Greyhound bus. They said I was too drunk. I wasn't going to get on one of their buses. And I ended up hitchhiking out of Charleston. I finally got home and uh, went looking for my car the next day. It took all day to find it. But, you know, I'm going to move on here to, uh, my, uh, to my last drunk. And I was married, and I had a two-year-old, or about a year-and-a-half-year-old son. And uh, me and my wife was separated. And I was trying to accept the idea, you know, he was going to get a divorce. And I was picking up my son on, on, on Sunday for about two hours. It's about all I could handle because of, of the emotional state I was in. And this one day I, I brought him home and, and, uh, and took him in the house. And she had a car and it had been broken down. And I had, was happened to have two vehicles and she considered a community property. And she, uh, said she wanted one of those cars. I said, if you want a car, have your boyfriend buy you a car. And, uh, and she got real angry and attacked me. And when she did, I grabbed her wrist and I twisted it real bad. And I think that's kind of what I wanted her to do. And anyway, I, I, went, I was in one of those rages, you know, and I forced myself out of the apartment, you know, and I went to get in my truck. And instead of getting in my truck, I, I went around the side of the building. That's where the, her boyfriend was, or the guy she was dating. And he was staying there with his sister in the same building. And I went back and, and I knocked on the door. And before somebody answered, I pushed it open. I seen him across the room and I just went right through the living room and across the coffee table and had him by the throat. And his sister happened to be dating a, an LAPD, which happened to be there. They both had me pinned on the floor and I, uh, I surrendered and they let me go. And as I walked out of there, you know, I called my, my wife was walking up the back steps and I called her every kind of whore I could think of. And, uh, and you know, that was, that was, that was my bottom. And, uh, you know, I was calling her and trying to give her more money for child support. You know, I was just doing anything. And, and, you know, I was still going to the bars and, you know, but, I couldn't get drunk and I really couldn't get sober. I was just, I was just really at the bottom. And I called my friend, uh, uh, Gil, that had been trying, talking this program. He worked, I worked with Gil for many years and he'd been sober for about 20 years. And, and so he was the guy I called and he took me to my first meeting. A moment of clarity for the alcoholic takes on many forms. For Steve W, it was a loss of companionship. It was in Glendale, California that Steve was to stumble onto a legendary AA meeting at a place called the Windsor Club. It was here that Steve started on his sober journey. I started going over to the Windsor Club there in Glendale. And uh, I remember some guy sitting next to me asked me why I was there. 
you know, and I, you know, and I told him I wasn't making enough money. I figured if I made, you know, if I made more money, you know, I, I could solve a lot of my problems. And I really didn't have any idea how sick I was. But you know, they used to, uh, well, they still do. Ask you have ask that you have at least 24 hours of sobriety before you can participate. You know, I didn't even know the definition of sobriety. And I was sitting there thinking, well, a meeting lasts for an hour and a half, so if I go to a meeting today, it's an hour and a half. If I go to one tomorrow, it's an hour and a half. And I'm sitting there counting up all of these, and I and I figured I could get 24 hours of sobriety that way. And uh, I bought the big book of Alcoholics Anonymous. The only reason I bought it was because they read portions of chapter 3 and 5 in the 12 traditions, and I knew they was going to ask me to read this one day, so I... I actually went home and I practiced on these three parts and actually taped my voice, you know, got a tape recorder and taped myself reading this stuff so I sounded just good enough, you know, I really want, that was my ways of going to any lengths, you know, for sobriety because I found that I really liked Alcoholics Anonymous, you know. I was sober about a month and I was walking the streets there in Burbank and my wife was dating this, she was in al and she was dating this, uh, alcoholic in the same place and I uh, and it was just tearing me up you know emotionally and my gut was just all twisted up in a knot and I remember it was I was in so much emotional pain I said I'm I just can't stand it I'm gonna go home and get so I decided to go home and get cleaned up and I'm going to uh, go to the Maritone Steakhouse and just really tie one on you know and I got to my apartment and and I remembered in Alcoholics Anonymous, you know, they tell you to turn this over to God. You know, and I got on my knees, you know, and I didn't ask God to keep me sober. I asked God to remove this pain from my stomach. And, uh, and you know, and that pain lessened just enough to where I was able to lay down and go to sleep. And, you know, and I got up the next day and continued going to meetings. But, you know, I have not had the obsession to drink since that night. And uh, I feel like I'm really one of the fortunate ones because I know a lot of people that really struggle with this, uh, still wanting to drink, you know. And I've been uh, going on uh, 27 years now. But of course, I still had a lot of work to do because like I told you, I didn't have a lick of sense before I got here. So I really had a lot of learning to do. And, and, uh, and you know, in a life, I had to change everything about my life. I got a sponsor, his name was Joe, and he took me through the steps. Yeah, I've been married for, right now, I've been married about eight years, and I have a six-year-old son. But before, I had a, uh, you know, the one, the, year, the, the boy that was a year and a half at the time, he, uh, right now, he's a, a Baltimore policeman. Just a few weeks ago, I went and watched him graduate from the uh, Baltimore Police Academy. You know, and uh, and he kind of grew up in Alcoholics Anonymous, and it was the people in Alcoholics Anonymous, you know, that uh, helped me raise that boy because I was a single parent for, for many years. And uh, you know, but I got to a point to where I wasn't going to that many AA meetings. And a little, a little over four years ago, I had taken up the uh, the sport of skydiving, and I had been skydiving for about ten years. But anyway, I had a major skydiving accident and it's put me in the hospital for two months and it tore my femur clear in two and I got uh, damage to my spinal cord from C3 to C6 and, and so a lot of my body is, uh, is all messed up. But you know, when I hit the ground that day and I couldn't move nothing but my eyelids, you know, I realized there was one thing missing, you know, I didn't even think about God. All the time I was laying there on the ground, you're like, God, please help me. You know, I was, and it's just like I'd left God behind there for, for many years. But anyway, I ended up in several hospitals, airlifted to uh, Loma Linda. And uh, that's where they did all the surgeries. And I ended up going back to uh, Glendale at Venice. And that's where I did my rehab. And... Uh, and I thank God for all the friends that I've made in Alcoholics Anonymous because it seemed like I was continuously had company, you know, which I loved, absolutely loved it. You know, it really helped me get through those two months. So anyway, I am just extremely grateful. 
that uh, that I'm in Alcoholics Anonymous, and I still do uh, three or four meetings a week. And because of Alcoholics Anonymous and the people in Alcoholics Anonymous, you know, it's it's really given me a way of life. And and a, uh, and I've been, like I said, I've been married for eight years now, and it's going very well. Steve is no longer on the inside of a jail cell, but on the inside of God's love, mercy, and grace. All this he found through the program of Alcoholics Anonymous. And I am extremely grateful for the for the program of Alcoholics Anonymous because you know it gave me a place to a place to go, and uh, and I found my God here in Alcoholics Anonymous. That. Uh, you know, I just don't have to go in those bars anymore. And I was, I was a daily bar drinker. And uh, I was always out there looking for companionship. You know, it was just extremely lonely out there. And, and in Alcoholics Anonymous, there's uh, people just like me. You know, we're all in here in this thing together, you know, and we're, and we're, and we're making it. You know, like tomorrow morning, you know, we have a, a Friday mornings, a lot of my, uh, three or four of my friends, you know, we. We take turns picking the restaurant that we're going to have breakfast at, you know. And tomorrow morning, you know, we're meeting over at Denny's or in Sunland at 7 o'clock. You know, and, and it's just getting together with, uh, with my buddies. And, uh, you know, I've been able to do things this, and on, on this program that there's no way I could have possibly done if I would have been out there uh, still in the bars, you know, and going to jails. And, you know, I, you know, I had five DUIs, you know. I don't have to be out there worrying about the cops anymore, you know. And I have insurance, you know, and I have a wonderful business going, you know. And I've had some wonderful experiences in sobriety. You know, these friends I'm talking about, you know, we did the Grand Canyon. We've hiked the Grand Canyon from the South Rim to the North Rim and back, you know, which is like 50 miles. We've taken many trip, bicycle trips, like from San Francisco to, uh, to uh, Glendale. And we did that like seven years in a row. You know, it's just... Uh, wonderful adventures you know uh, my friend Dave that I'm having uh, breakfast with tomorrow you know taught me how to rock climb and uh, we used to take groups out of the Windsor Club and go to the uh, uh, Joshua Tree and, you know and we learned how to rock climb we had all the ropes we bought all the gear you know we just had a wonderful wonderful time you know and I was able to take my my son and teach him how to repel and to climb and uh, you know it's just uh, extremely, extremely grateful that, you know, I've been able to do all of these things. And, uh, you know, it's because of the people in Alcoholics Anonymous and being able to stay sober. And I could only do it. I could have only have done it in Alcoholics Anonymous. Nothing else ever worked, you know. The people in Alcoholics Anonymous, you know, I absolutely love the people in Alcoholics Anonymous. Uh, you know, it seems like we really care for each other, you know. If any of you out there is having any kind of a problem, you know, Give Alcoholics Anonymous a shot, man, because it is the best deal in town. And, uh, and I found my God here in Alcoholics Anonymous that uh, you know, I just don't have to go in those bars anymore. And I was, I was a daily bar drinker. And uh, with that, I thank you for allowing me to share. When the river runs dry, I find
You've been listening to The Bottom Line, featuring Steve W. Story. Thank you, Steve, for caring enough to carry the message right here on this program we call The Bottom Line. This show is produced for American Forces Network worldwide. I'm Gary Thiemann. Until next time, God bless you, and carry the message, won't you? This has been a GRT production.